Good morning, good morning. This is Jamaica Live. Uh, we're on Bridge 99. This is Bruce Golding. We're broadcasting here from Kingston, Jamaica. The studios of uh, Bridge 99, but we broadcast as well uh, to the diaspora through Irish um, in New York. So, welcome to the program. Today, today is what, the 30th of January. Um, I should mention that we, we, we're also carried live. We're also carried live on, on our YouTube channel. And I must mention, you know, that uh, there was quite, quite a bit of feedback on the YouTube channel to last week's program. Uh, many of them were saying that they were tuning in for the first time. Some of them said they didn't know that the program existed. So we welcome all of them. And we found uh, many of the comments that they made to be very, to be very useful. So we're back here, uh, Bridge 99, Jamaica Live. We're back here to do it all over again on this station. There was an interesting news item that appeared in the Gleaner last week, Monday, that does not seem to have attracted much attention. It said that Jamaica had recorded a 47% reduction in murders since the start of this year. It is perhaps just as well that it didn't command much attention because the year has just started. We had only gone three weeks uh, at the time when, when that report was published. And three weeks, three weeks out of 52, is just too short a time to determine whether this is a pattern that will continue. So it is not yet cause to celebrate, but it certainly gives us reason to have hope. And if this trend were to continue for the rest of the year, my God, that certainly would be cause for celebration. But we would also have to carefully analyze how it came about. Was it the extended use of the states of emergency? Was it better policing, greater and more effective police presence in crime-prone areas? Was it better investigative work to apprehend the murder perpetrators? Was it the imminence of harsher penalties? You know, like the mandatory minimum 45 years imprisonment on which imprisonment for murder on which both the government and the opposition have found agreement. But we, the question has to be asked, why does Jamaica have one of the highest murder rates in the world? Many explanations have been offered by social scientists by psychologists and criminologists. But I'm yet to see an analysis that convincingly, convincingly answers that question. The easy answer that rolls off the tongues of many people is that it is politics that cause it. Now, there was some truth to that back in the 1960s and 1970s, but no one can argue factually that the political struggle today between the JLP and the PNP is characterized by violence. In fact, the seven elections that we have held over the last 30 years have been relatively free of violence. Plus, th there are several countries that experience intense political violence. Countries like Lebanon, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and I could name a number of others. But our murder rate is between 10 and 15 times higher than theirs. So I don't buy this thing about political violence because that, don't, that, doesn't, that doesn't give me the answers that I think we need to find. 
Some will even say that today's level of violence and murders has its roots in the guns that politicians are alleged to have distributed to their gangs back in the 60s and 70s. But good God, man, those guns are probably rusted by now. Or they can't fire no shot no more. Or they may have been captured by the police. Yes, they will say, but the politicians created the culture. But you know, that is like saying that because you give your son a toy gun as a Christmas present, that that is going to turn him into a gunman. I mean, go on Amazon and see the amount of toy guns that are there and people buy them up at Christmas time. We can't buy them here because they've been banned for the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years. But lots of people in America and other countries um, buy toy guns for their kids. Um, there's no evidence that that turns old kids into, into gunmen. Some have suggested that our high murder rate is linked to poverty and neglect. You know, the argument is that people have to live. And when they can't earn a decent living, they turn to crime, grabbing what doesn't belong to them. Because that's the only way they can survive. And grabbing what doesn't belong to them very often leads to murder. But again, the facts do not support that argument. There's a whole heap of countries where on a per capita basis they are poorer than Jamaica. A country like India. You know India has been recording some significant economic growth over the last 10, 15 years. But despite all of that, there are millions of people in India who live in abject poverty. And the per capita income in India is lower than Jamaica. So too is Ghana, Cambodia, Tanzania, Pakistan, Uganda, Philippines, Zambia, Bolivia, Vietnam. These are countries where the per capita income is lower than Jamaica. Near a home, Belize. But they don't have the high murder rate that we have. Would you believe, for example, that Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Malawi, on a per capita basis, are poorer than even Haiti? But they don't experience the high murder rate that we have in Jamaica. So why is our murder rate so high? And that leads us to the question of law enforcement and raises a number of important questions. One, are our laws strict enough to deter people from committing murder? Are our policing methods and strategies effective enough? Is there a conflict between the upholding of human rights as is enshrined in our constitution and the measures that are needed to curb what has been called the violence producers, you know, to deal with this epidemic of crime. These violence producers who murder mean people as if laws do not exist and as, and, uh, and as if policemen are only there to direct traffic. And if such a conflict exists, is it that we must, con we must choose one or the other? We must either decide we must decide either to preserve human rights or rid the country of the murderers. Or is there a balance that must be struck, ceding some of our human rights protection in return for protecting our lives, in return for creating a safe society? You know, recently the Prime Minister said that Jamaica could take note should take note of the crime-fighting efforts in El Salvador. Now, El Salvador has had a serious problem with gang violence and murders, and they had the ignominious decision, the, the, the uh, 
position, distinction of having the highest murder rate in the world. We were number two. El Salvador was number one. But they elected a new president some time ago, a guy called Nayib Bukele. And he made it his all-out mission to crack down on what they would we call violence producers, the criminal elements. And, you know, if you look at the El Salvador situation, El Salvador, El Salvador is... It's, it has a population a little a little more than twice Jamaica's and you know we have each year we record over a thousand murders some years as high as 1600 some years it will drop down to 1200 but for the last 20 years every year over a thousand people are murdered in Jamaica well in, in El Salvador it is much more than that they, their murder rate peaked in 2015 when they had a murder rate, murder total of 6,656. In 2016, it fell to 5,280. 2017, it was just about 4,000. 2018, it was a little over 3,000. But after the government cracked down last year, They lock up over 60,000 people. Over 60,000 people were arrested because they they declared a state of emergency and they have kept that state of emergency in place since then. And over 60,000 people were detained. I don't know how many of them have been released, but the impression I get is that many of them are still being held. And I saw a report last week where they are building an emergency prison because the prison capacity that they have can't hold them. But for last year, remember, you know, this is a country that in 2015 had over 6,600 murders. Well, last year for the whole year, they had 495 murders. Less than 500. 495 murders. Now, human rights bodies, including Amnesty International, have been outraged at what they regard as the flagrant abuse of human rights. I haven't had a chance to look at the Constitution of El Salvador. So I don't know whether or not their human rights protection provisions are as robust as ours. I don't know whether they have, you know, um, less stringent human rights clauses. But the human rights bodies have said that what is going on there is that flagrant violation of human rights. But the truth of the matter is that the measures enjoy broad public support. Bill Kelly, the president, has an approval rating of 86% according to recent public opinion polls. I can't think of any other president or prime minister who has ever enjoyed that level of approval. And you know, a similar story can be told of the Philippines where former President Rodrigo Duterte embarked on a serious crackdown of criminal gangs. Serious human rights violations were reported. But the level of gang violence and murders declined precipitously. His approval rating when he left office was over 70%. Is that a path that Jamaica should follow? Is there a price that we must be prepared to pay to bring an end or to reduce to tolerable levels the current violent crimes and the murders that we have to suffer every day? And if so, what is that price? How much is too much? And are we prepared to pay anything at all? We all yearn for the day when we can tune into the news and not hear about persons who were shot and killed last night. We all yearn for the day when a woman who lives in a depressed community can go to bed and sleep restfully with our children without wor worrying that her feeble door 
will be kicked down and she will be slaughtered in her bed or her house set on fire. Let me let me tell you a story. What? Need a break? L- let me let me tell you a story. When I was a teenager, I look forward like most other teenagers at that time. I look forward to the weekends because there was always a party somewhere to go to. And this time it was a party in Harborview. In those days, the JOS, what we used to call Jolly Joseph, but what we now call JUTC, the JOS ran a disciplined bus service. They ran on schedule. And some of the major bus stops, like the one at Harborview, they had the schedule displayed in a glass case to tell you what time the buses would arrive and what time they would depart. So I took the bus and went to this party. It was a sweet 16th birthday party for a friend of mine. When I came off the bus at Harborview, I checked the schedule to see what time the last bus back to town would leave. And he told me that the last bus left that would leave at 11.30 p.m. So, you know, I figured that I would I'd have to leave the party by about quarter past 11. Rushed down to the roundabout to catch the last bus. In those days, party started around 8 o'clock and would be over by half past 12, 1 o'clock. Not like today. Where that is about the time when the parties begin. But when it got to 11 o'clock, the party was still in high swing. And I was having a whale of a time. And I decided I'm not leaving this party to go catch the last bus. I will have to be prepared to walk it home. So eventually I left the party a little before 1 o'clock in the morning to start the long walk home to Lady Musgrave Road where I was living at the time. I walked from Harborview Roundabout through Rockfort, Windward Road, up Mountain View Avenue to Lady Musgrave Road. And the only thing that I had to be concerned about were the dogs because the dogs then would rush out at you. So I found a piece of stick and walked with it in, in my hand and I hold up the stick menacingly to make the dog know that if you mess with me, I would look out you, was it, was it. Would I do that today? <laughs> no way. Would I allow any of my grandchildren to do that today? You're crazy. But that is the kind of Jamaica we want to get back, where people can go about their business without fearing that they may not get back home alive. So how do we get there? What steps do we need to take? What understandings do we need to arrive at? What compromises do we have to make? What balance between human rights and peace and security do we have to strike? I'll tell you another story. Many years ago, when I was leader of the opposition, I met with Mr. Lee Brown. Some of you may not remember who that is. I'll tell you in a moment when we come back from the break. Welcome back. Jamaica Live. We're on Bridge 99. I was saying before we took the break uh, that I had the opportunity of meeting with Mr. Lee Brown. Uh, Mr. Lee Brown served as police commissioner in Houston and then in New York. And in both those jurisdictions, he oversaw a dramatic reduction in crime and murders. So I asked him, how did you manage to accomplish that? And he explained that he revolutionized the concept of community policing, where uh, policemen became the friends of the community, not people to be feared and despised, and that this allowed them to get valuable information which helped them to nab the murderers before they were able to commit more murders. But he went on to say that he networked with local, state, and federal agencies to address the problems in the inner city communities where much of the crime came from and to address the the problems in there you know like collecting the garbage and providing street lights and fixing the roads and ensuring that there was reliable water supply 
and in addition providing skills training for the youth in these communities and helping them to find jobs as alternatives to the life of crime that many of them were taken up with. And this, he said, involved millions of dollars of expenditure. It is what sociologists refer to as social intervention. So I asked him, I said, would you have achieved the level of success in reducing crime without those social intervention measures? He said, absolutely not. Many of our sociologists and commentators have put forward the same position. If we are to reduce crime, we must first fix the communities. The problem is, how long will it take us to find the money to do that? And do we have to continue being the victims of murderers until we can find that money? Or do we divert money from our schools or from the hospitals or from fixing the roads in those communities where the roads are so bad that, that even junk row won't fly over them? And do we have to wait until we find that money to be able to live in a safe environment? The Minister of National Security said some time ago that the billions of dollars that the government has spent on social intervention measures have not resulted in any reduction in crime and violence coming from those communities where those programs were targeted. Is it that something was wrong with the program? Is it that the programs were not well designed and well executed? Is that a, 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 is that a, a condemnation of social intervention measures or is it that we just didn't do it the right way? So where do we go? What should we do? That is our discussion today with some eminent guests who we have lined up for this program. And I'm very pleased to bring on as our first guest today, former Commissioner of Police and former Chief of Defence Staff, uh, Rear Admiral Hardly Lewin. Rear Admiral Lewin, welcome to the program. Good morning to you. Morning, sir. How are you? I am very well indeed. I, boy, that was a long run up to the pitch there. What can I tell you? My, my name is Michael Holding. <laughs> tell me, um, human rights protection and effective crime reduction. Uh, is there a conflict between those two and is there a trade-off that has to be made? I'm going to speak in the context of Jamaica. That's where I can talk about. And um, to be very frank with you, I cannot see right now any reason for a trade-off. The existing laws, rules, regulations that we have, I think are quite adequate. Now, I am not squeamish. So if that situation were ever to change, I'll be the first to suggest that we have some trade-off. But I can tell you very frankly, I am not there. Now, when a state... Can I interrupt you there, though, sure. Rear Admiral? The mere application of a state of emergency implies a suspension of certain human rights. Because there are certain things that cannot be done outside of a state of emergency. So if, 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 is that in itself not a recognition that sometimes the situation you're trying to deal with is of such a severity that we need to curb back some of the human rights protection in order to deal with what is a serious threat to human rights, which is the right to life? No, you're absolutely correct. But if you... If you I have never been in agreement with the current SOEs as they have been running from 2018. So, um, you know, I did not see the reason for the state of emergency. That is my assessment. Now, it doesn't mean that we did not have to do some serious uh, policing. Now, we have some concepts in Jamaica about hard policing, soft policing, and so on. And as far as I'm concerned, no such thing exists. We are looking for professional policing. And what does that mean? It means that you're going to be as hard as is absolutely necessary under the law and as soft as you can be to achieve your aim. So this dichotomy between hard and soft policing, as far as I'm concerned, is a non-entity. You spoke to 
community policing based on what you're told um, by that um, commissioner from overseas. We have always said we practice community policing. It is just a mantra. It is a mantra. You cannot police. Look, policing is at the local level. And I've always said to police officers, I don't send you out to be friends, but you must be friendly. You must be courteous. But, you know, Mr. Golden, you and I are old enough to go back to the days to look at how we deal with our own people. When we didn't have all these crime problems, how we dealt with the Rastafarians. I've seen so many lives destroyed by what we have done to some of our people. So when you have to resort to the situation that you have in El Salvador um, or where else, it tells me that there's a gross failure of successive leadership. Because what we have done in Jamaica is to sit back and watch a simple cut grow to a sore, fester, 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 till you reach the point where you're saying the only thing left to do is something draconian. But we allow that to happen. We watch it happen. We are never anticipatory when it comes on to law enforcement. Well, let, 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 me, let me explore something with you. I mean, I have been told by policemen, people who are on the front line, and I'm sure that, I mean, you were commissioned. I'm sure that you have, you, you have experienced it. I'm told by policemen that, look, we're not short of information, you know. We know what is going on because we are on the ground. We get information from people. Our problem is that nobody is prepared to come to the station and give us no statement. Worst of all, nobody is prepared to come to court and stand up and give evidence and be cross-examined by some hostile defense attorney. And therefore, we are full of information, but we can't go any further because the system does not allow us. We can't go block up the man purely on the basis of information. We have to have evidence. Now, how how you get around that problem? Well, um, you said you get. They have lots of information. The first thing you have to do with information is to process that into intelligence. Now, some information is such that you have to act immediately. So the question is, what are the things that are impeding citizens coming forward? There's a lack of trust in the systems and the structures that will give people the kind of confidence that will make them want to come forward to give information. We should be spending more money on witness protection if that is a big issue. We should be spending more money on cleaning up the force. Those are the things that's going to give confidence. We should have more communications at a local level, and we should really depress the concept of community policing right down through the system. I, because I, there's a crisis of confidence. I, 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 I hate to sound so, 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 sort of ticklish and nigglish on it, but, but former commissioner, tell me. Um, so, wait, so, sorry, you, suppose you provide the money and you, you, you take the person into witness protection. Don't ask me how long that is going to be. Don't ask me whether or not they will ever be able to return to the community. But who else are you going to take? You're going to take them brother and sister and uncle? Because you know that the criminals out there, them don't have to get the person they want. They just want to send a signal. But, but Mr. Golan, it's not just a matter of just picking up the witness, their families, everybody, and put them away, put them safe, put them overseas for a very long time. You have somebody in custody. You have to work on that people, person. Can you turn that individual now to turn against his members? You have to be doing many things concurrently. So it's not just a matter of saying, I have a witness here, I want to convict him, I'm going to do this to him. There are many concurrent things you have to do. There are many things that's going to restore confidence. Many things. When we see convictions start to happen, we see um, gangs start to be dismantled, People are put away where they belong in prison. Confidence will be built. So I don't buy the argument about money. The question is, where are we spending the money? Where are we spending the money? Well, in terms of priorities, but boy, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you and I can sit down and go through the budget 
um, whether the overall budget or the budget for the security forces. Um, don't ask me how you shift that money around, because almost every line item seems like it need it need it need to be increased. Yes, but we we we, we hear ever so often that this administration has spent the greatest amount of investment in the security forces. That is absolutely correct, and they ought to be congratulated for what they are spending. However, I would ask the question, um, the areas that we are spending it, is it the greatest priority? What are the plans? For instance, for instance, we have a number of, how should I say, high-ticket items. I'm wondering, are those things that could have been postponed? The military has gotten a large chunk of that. Now, I spent 36 years there. But I'm a Jamaican first, and I'm happy for the military. But our primary law enforcement agency is the police. I would love to see the proportion that was spent that is not on salary, but on equipment and so on and so forth. I'd love to see that. Are we, are we, are we employing technology robustly enough? as part of the strategy for dealing with, with crime? Well, I, I kind of differ, and I'm not too... Uh, while technology is useful, and we must get technology, we seem to be spreading ourselves in all kinds of technologies. And let me tell you something. If you don't have people with the mindset, with the enhanced thinking, with the enhanced operational planning, with the enhanced operational deployment and execution, to maximize the use of that technology. You're only going to get 10%. Will it help? Yes. But are you maximizing the use of these very expensive pieces of kit? This is what I would ask. And for that, you've got to invest in people. And on the other hand, when you have your own corrupt policemen, and indeed soldiers too, who are working against their very own, what's the point? Tell me, it becomes more difficult. Tell me, are we able, and have we been able over a long period of time, but are we able to attract uh, to the police force the, 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 the kind of caliber of people that it needs, or is it that people, many people kind of join the force when other opportunities just are not available? The answer is yes and yes. Um, we, the police force, is attracting qualified people. Yes, you may get some who have nothing else to do. But the fact of the matter is, having gotten them, let, let, let's take one thing that's happening right now. Have we yet settled the matter of salaries with the police? The, the, the police are not going to be very happy. We have not settled that. Um, they got, I don't think they got anything for Christmas. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but could you not have given them an advance on what it is that they are to get? Pending settlement. Yes. Mm. Um, then there are many other things that I, I, I wrote two papers, you know, Rethinking Policing in Jamaica. And one of the things I question is the whole training and the mindset. Because when you look at the training, and I cut that down from nine months to six, because we were doing, we we're militarizing the police. And it starts at the training school. It starts at the training school. Because of that, it slows down the throughput. Expl Through explain that uh, uh, some more for me. When you say militarizing, then you mean what? The training is heavily focused, or a lot of it, on drill, bush training, and certain other things. There are some skills that are being taught there, which I think belong to, like, the mobile reserve, or whatever it is called now. What you want is a basic policeman, because it takes two years to train a policeman. When he passes out, he has to complete two years before he's confirmed. So policemen don't come easy. It's not like uh, Juliana did in New York, where he just advertised throughout the United States and hired 6,000 people in a matter of weeks. We have got to identify, recruit, train. After that, two years, they become a police, a rookie police, then they have to gain experience. Yes? So they don't come too easily. Is, is, is our training is our training specialized enough? Uh, by that I mean, um, uh, uh, somebody who is going to be f f called a 
dedicated to traffic management, road traffic. That person don't need to be trained how to fight gunmen. Hmm? Uh, you know, Mr. Golden, I think that's where we make a mistake. How often have you been sitting down in your vehicle, let's like, say, at a traffic light, and you see, uh, let's say, a taxi man commit the most egregious offense, and you saw a police vehicle. You see a police vehicle right there. When the offense was committed, say, yes, I'm gone now, and you look and you wait, and nothing happens. You know why? The mindset is, no, man, that's a job for the traffic police. It's not for me. So part of the thing to, 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 to how should I say, maximize the use of police officers, that the police officer must first know that he is a police officer enforcing all the laws of the country. However, I am assigned to the traffic division where I get further training. So I hear you. There's a lot of things that has to be done to train. I'm telling you, Mr. Bowling, a lot of what we need to do, yes, you need some technology, yes, you need that and so on, but it's to change the mindset, is to look after the individual officers whom we are sending out there, keeping them clean, right? how we deal with them out on operations, how we look after their welfare, and most importantly, supervision on the ground. Supervision on the ground. Rear Admiral, how are you doing? I'm, I'm out of time, but thank you very much for joining me, and thank you for starting the discussion. I'm sure that we're going to get a, a, a range of views in response to, to the points that you have made. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay, sir. That's Rear Admiral Hardy Lowen, former Commissioner of Police. Um, we're going to get another view now, which may be somewhat different. And that's from uh, someone who, who whose name is almost a household name in Jamaica. Uh, retired Senior Superintendent of Police, Mr. Renato Adams. Um, SSP Adams, how are you? Um, 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 I'm very well, sir. Yes. I, I don't know that I can correct her. Uh, ex-Prime Minister, but the name, the real pronunciation is Renito, not Renato. Renito. Renito, R-E-N-E-T-O. Right. Uh, boy, my mistake. It's old age. Forget no, me. no, it's not a mistake. It's not that. <laughs> I just want to make the correction. I, it's not the alone. Everybody, yeah. even in my own family, too. Yeah, people, you know, don't have the right name. But it's Renito de Cardova Valentina. <laughs> All right. You better <laughs> stop this <laughs> Tell me now. Yes. The, the, the crime problem. You have been on the front line. You have been a, 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 a well-known crime fighter out there. Yes. Can we deal with the crime problem we have and um, at the same time vigorously and, and jealously protect human rights or we have to find a way to, to walk between the two? Funnily enough, Mr. Golden, when most persons have heard me say that you don't really have to encroach and reduce the human rights of our poor people to deal with crime. You know, I don't even know that we have reached that stage. Because as far as I'm concerned, the, 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 if you give the ordinary police man or the police force the necessary freedom, the necessary tools, well, free, freedom, free, freedom to do what? Because if a policeman come to my door now, yes. unless he has reasonable cause to believe that I'm about to commit a crime, he can't come into my place without a warrant. I know, but the freedom I'm talking about is to make sure that freedom is covered by law. So you see, when a crime, when a country has become as crime infested as we have become. Then therefore, it is incumbent on the authorities and especially so the government to make sure that that problem is solved. And one of the problems we have is that we have gone all over the world, world Mr. Golden, and signed all the different kind of conventions not knowing that some of these con con conventions 
will militate against the way we govern our country. But, that, but, but those conventions that we have signed on to, those are conventions that are intended to protect people's human rights. Yes, but you see... So you seem, you, you, you seem to be talking on both sides of the argument. No, I am only saying that whatever we sign to over the world must be able to go simultaneously in a, in a very um, contrite way with our circumstances, uh, the circumstances we confront. Well, uh, that, so in that, other words... If we have crime to the extent that, you know, uh, what, I think I've about 65 murders since this year, and we, are, we haven't yet finished the month, then anything we sign to must be consistent with what we do to deal with circumstances in our independent country. Well, that and is... Not to soon inter- and not to suit international community well that is where i wanted that's where i want to, to to get your views because what you're saying is that we must be prepared to pay a price now the yes. question the question is how much are we prepared to pay I, I, well, I, I put it to i put it to the former commissioner a while ago and i want to put it to you and yes. i'm sure i'm sure that you will confirm that you have had this experience yes you know that crime is taking place in a certain location or local yes. Yes. You have information on the ground because you go in there. And yes. people will call you and round the back of the bar and whisper, tell you things. And yes. another one will, will buck you up on, uh, on the road somewhere and stop you and will whisper in years and tell you things. You get information so you know what is going on. Yes. But none of them that whispering to you, none of them prepare to give you a statement. None of them prepare to go to court because they're afraid. And, right. that, and there's a way to deal with that. How you deal with that? You deal with that by developing, which will take many years, you know, not no one day business, developing a very proactive, preventative police force. Yes. So you have to anticipate. You have to be very, you have to be very forthright in what you do. Anticipate that this will be happening. Uh, let me give you an example. But you can't be and everywhere are, everywhere 24 hours a day. If not you alone, sir, there's the whole force. That but the whole force can't be there either. What, no, what, really what, what, what this man in El Salvador has done, you know, is that yes. when, they, when, when them get the information, information, yes. not even intelligence yet, information, yes. them lock them up. So them have 61,000 people that them lock up since last year, March. Now, their murder but, rate has plunged but, from 5,000-odd. Last year, it was less than 500 murders. 500. But, I'm but, but, look at, but, but look at what has happened to people's human rights down there. I mean, have some, some of the people them lock up are well, innocent people. Mr. Some Golden, of them have died in the lockup. Is, is that a price that we must pay? And I'm not going that far. All I am saying, if we do what is right, we have the cooperation in parliament of all the houses, the both parties together and all that, we can make laws that will address that situation and doesn't have to go as far as El Salvador has done. All I am saying, we have to now determine, Mr. Golding, whether we want a disease uh, and b- dif- differentiate between two diseases that one will kill you in 30 years and one will kill you in one second so cancer will kill you in 30 years the gunshot will kill you in one second so we have to determine which way we want rights will always be infringed but do you want your country and your people to be all killed off in one second, or you would rather have a spread over the next 30 years. So if we want to have a spread over the next 30 years, then we continue with the foolishness we are doing. But if we want to terminate the situation, then we put rules and regulations, like I give you an example. So make us say along King Street at 9 p.m. at night, 
you find that 25 stores are broken into. You following me? Mm. Good. So what you do, you make sure you make laws that no one is seen within 9 p.m. on 12 midnight on King Street. It is simple. And if they shift their time of breaking, then you extend the law. And to make sure the police is there and so on. To deal with that situation. So all we need is to make sure we respond to the circumstance at hand in a very forceful, stringent way. Even to the extent on what we call rights. Tell me, We're not going to kill people by, 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 by infringing on their rights. But I'm not advocating infringing on them rights. I don't know. I am only telling you when I run into what I'm telling you this, that we have not reached anywhere yet where we should be infringing, right, right. infringing on the rights of Jamaican people to any great extent that you cannot deal with this crime. Well, you know, we don't have any law, so Mr. Golden, right now here you people contemplating a law for murder and all these things. We don't have any law in Jamaica that is serving as a deterrent to criminal elements. What do you mean by that? A man can kill 10 people today, and next week he's back on the street and bail. Because what? His human rights. So we don't look on those who we kill 10 people and their rights have been totally... No, but, yeah, yeah, but... And, the, but yeah, and yeah. forever, and forever terminated. But the human rights people will say that you're going to have somebody who you lock up and keep him in lockup on the basis that him kill 10 people and him never kill no 10 people. He's the wrong man well, you have. Well, what they and, and, and plenty of those, they're whole for people, you know, who would have loved to see you back in uniform and back on the road. Yes, but, 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 yes, there, yes, but uh, there are a lot of people who are who are arguing that, boy, we really need to get rough and tough. We need to do what this man do in El Salvador. Now, of course, most of the people who are saying that are people who know that their rights are never going to be trampled on. Nobody going to mess with them rights, so they don't mind if, if other people right. By, by what this man has done in El Salvador... Maybe the ordinary common people like you and I who can't afford God yes. and targets and all them things are now happy over there and free. Maybe we should start a research and ask them how they feel as against those who these it is where we have all over the world. All they do is talk and talk and talk because they are not being trampled. Now, one, one of the things that people don't understand, you know, is that, that I mean, let us say that I live in, live in a ghetto, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a youth. And I, yes. I fit the profile. So sometimes it's not that the police man them have any, anything against me personally, you know. It's just that them just scrape me up and I go on a, a, a jail somewhere. And, when, and hold on, no. When I go to jail somewhere and I now have to go to court to go beg the court to give me bail, is lawyer I forget. Now, I don't know if you have hired a lawyer recently, but they're not come cheap. No, 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 come cheap. I so so you. Where, where is that poor youth from the ghetto going to find the hundred and a thousand dollars that he might have to find before the lawyer will even look on the case? Well, we, we have the alternative, you know, so we have a fair charge and all that stuff. We have, we, we have, we have what you call the, um, what you call yeah. it. You have legal aid and all them stuff. But them no, them thing no work and all that stuff. Them but no but work that's, stuff, you know. No, but you have to make them work, Mr. Golding. No, man, no, man, no, man. You, you can be in, in, you can be in lockup for uh, three months before legal aid reach round to you. Yes, but I don't know. I was in the force, and I, I don't know that I ever willfully <coughs> just scrape up somebody who I don't have as a suspect. No, I, I, I you know, yeah, but it happened, you know. It, it happens. happens. Right. It happens, but I am saying, Mr. Golding, as long as the rights that have been infringed on you. As far as I'm concerned, if he didn't end up in debt, or you be mean, or anything, that is something we have to live with until we become so disciplined. Tell me. That we do not have to do that anymore. Tell me. The former commissioner said that he, he don't consider that the state of emergency are necessary. He think that the police have enough authority <laughs> under the law to Thank be you, able sir. to deal with the problem. You see, he, he mentioned, he mentioned, he mentioned that there were other issues that needed to be addressed, but he says yes. that 
he does not believe that they need state of emergency in order to deal with this problem. You agree with that? So you remember, in my love, you remember March and I said, we don't reach the stage yet. Mm. Where we have to infringe on people's rights. Mm. You just have to properly train the police, motivate them, give them the necessary tools and law. And when I say train them, I don't mean, oh, for the fire gun, you know. You train them psychologically, right? You train them to monitor and to put in practice, the, you know, artificial intelligence, all the intelligence that is available, proactiveness, preemptiveness. Put them in large numbers. Mr. Gordon, you are a prime minister. I don't know if you have ever gone to Cuba. Did you know almost every street there you every street you go and you see a policeman? Yeah, well, I know they're covered. And most, Tell me. And most crimes most crimes in Cuba are solved in Nadia. Tell me. Our our court system, is that an obstacle to coming to grips with the crime problem? In terms of how it works? Well we must have a court, but how they operate is more than an obstacle. I I retired 15 years now, and when I, in the first 10 years, when I retired, I still had a case going. Man for murder when me see, you know. And I guess, me guess, I was coming from a woman, said two men, attack a man, shot him dead right out of Greenfield. And Mr. Golden, 10 years after, before he killed herself, and I waited and waited till what? You hear them say uh, one weakness no come, then next year them put out the case, the other one no come. The only weakness but, but that I, was left is for me, one Rene to Adams. But I, the, I would have a problem, you know, if, if I was a witness in a case and uh, for something that happened 10 years ago. Yes. Any little defense attorney would have tied me up, you know, because help me if you go remember every little detail 10 years ago. And that was an answer to you when, I, when we talk about you know, um, we have to have quick trial. I don't know if you know how in Cuba murder must be tried within a year and the appeal must be within six months after. And you either get where you go to the gallows or you go to prison. Yeah, follow you. We here, uh, we don't use search system. I have no doubt that we have cases in the court of Jamaica State going for the last 15 years. Let I mean, ask, I talk civil cases, I talk about criminal cases. Let me ask you a question now. You're a retired police officer. Yes, sir. I am sure there are many retired police officers out there. I don't know what they're doing. Some of them, I believe, are working with security companies and so on. But is there yes. a role in our fight against crime? Is there a role that we ought to carve out? for people who have retired from the force because they reach a mandatory age, but okay. they have they have a wealth of experience. They still have a lot of institutional memory. They still know a lot of what is happening on the ground. Is there not a role that we ought to carve out for them to say that those who are willing to continue to serve could, 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 could bring that experience and that training to bear in helping us to deal with this crime problem? Yeah, perfect, Mr. Golden. When I applied for the post of Commissioner of Police and I went and did the interview and they asked me what I would have brought to 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 to, to the to force to reduce crime. And I I, 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 I told them that, that I would develop a a, 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 a a brain bank or a brain trust where I would see to it that whether the government or the private sector employs um, these ex-police officers. You remember you were young um, when people like Jess Marsh and all these people? Yes, yes. They never went alone shooting nobody, you know, and all that. And the cases were solved. Mr. Hibbert, I can call a hundred of them, and many of them have been there, and they don't utilize them services. Right. And guess what? They said they changed the police force. I don't know if you remember this story. There's a book, The Underdevelopment of Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, I, I, I am not suggesting I am not suggesting that they, they block the advancement of younger officers, you know. They retire so that whoever is to get the promotion, get the promotion. But after they retire, I'm saying we must be able to find a way 
that they can legally continue yes. to help us to deal with this crime problem, given the yes. wealth of experience that they have. Well, what are the problems we have, you know, Mr. Golden? And I'm not against education because we are rich in life. Education is responsible for 99% of it. But you said a man no, and he has a, a master's degree. And say martyr or master's degree in some other thing that has nothing to do with the force. And you turn him in, you turn him into commissioner. Tell me what contribution he is. He is capable of contributing to the force. So you think about, you said about the young men. Yes, you have no problem. But if you do a research, Mr. Gold, you're not going to challenge you to do it. But most of these people in the police force now have them whole heap of degree. If most of them are even not smart percentage of them, has a degree that contributes significantly to the management, development, and dealing with crime where the force is concerned. Well, you check that and tell me. Well, so we have to curtail this thing, <laughs> put it into perspective, proper perspective. No, sir, for you to become a superintendent overnight as a young man, 23, 24, 25, you must at least have a degree, right? In crime management, our criminology, our ballistics, our forensics, our evidence um, um, production management, and all these things. This is happening in the force. We have a whole heap of money in the force, Mr. Goldie. This is then degree, 10 crocodiles back there and hold it. And none of it is contributing to the betterment of the force. In terms of the discipline that they study, you mean? In terms of the discipline that mm. they study. Yeah. That is it. Uh, uh, when I, I joined the force and served 41 years, three months, Mr. Goldie, and you know every course I went on, every developmental course I went on, I made sure it was a police to deal a police course to deal with crime and prisoner management. SSP, I'm out of yes, time. Sir. We have to go, we have to go cut it off there. But thank you and very, left, thank you very much left. for coming on. No sir, happiness. Good, good. Retired Superintendent of Police Renito Adams joining us today to talk about this business of crime fighting and human rights protection. Uh, the question of whether or not there's a conflict and how we manage that. Uh, we're going to be back shortly when we, after we take the break. Oh, welcome back. Uh, it's Jamaica Live. Uh, we're on Bridge 99. We've been having a, a very spirited discussion today. The question of respecting human rights and um, pursuing effective crime fighting strategies. Is there a conflict? And ought there to be some kind of compromise, some kind of trade-off? Um, we had former Commissioner of Police, Rear Admiral Hardy Lewin. We had former Senior Superintendent of Police, Renito Adams. And we're going to be continuing that discussion, but let me hail up Beauregard in the meanwhile. How are you, my friend? How are you doing, Mr. Golden? Good, good, good. Um, hope hope I'm, at, uh, I'm commanding some interest, you know, because I know your people up there are very concerned about what is happening back home. Of course, definitely. The conversations are always interesting. Yeah, um, we don't have the kind of crazy mass shootings that you have in America, but we still have too much murders taking place. Definitely, sir. Um, man, you, yeah. man, you, the, the, January has started off much better than January last year, but I'm not prepared to celebrate yet. I want to see whether or not that is a trend that will continue. And you're speaking about in Jamaica, started off better in Jamaica. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Because the you number know, of uh, murders in January here is a significant reduction to what we had in January last year. But as I say, too early right. to determine and whether or not this is going to be a pattern. And on this side, we have had so many mass shootings taking place yes. in the United States since the new year started, yes. you know. And one of the most um, disturbing situations that we are facing right now is the, the young man that was killed. His name is Tyree Nichols, yes. in, um, Memphis, yes. by the five black yes. police officers, you know. That's something that they, the black community is dealing with. I mean, the whole United States is dealing with it. But, you know, for the fact that these officers are black who um, actually but can are, I, but, but, but carried can, out this act. Can, I, can I be mischievous, though? Yes, sir. If those five officers were white, would they have been charged already? 
they probably would not have been charged already because we have seen the the history and the pattern where when white officers are involved that it takes you know even over a year for them to be charged yes. for a year for the the footage to come out for a year for for them to you know be fired or anything sometimes they get put on leave and they're still being yeah. paid while the investigation is going on so you know it's just crazy how this situation is being dealt with differently yeah. um you know some people are happy that it's being dealt with this way and that it should be dealt with this way going forward whether you know those involved are black or white the officers well that is how it should be yes that's the right. way it should be um right. but you know it's just where this is the first time we're seeing um it handled this way and swiftly yes. um and it being involved with five black officers this time so you know um there uh, there's been protests taking place here in the united states i've noticed um, that and but I'm it has it has not has been as much as we have seen when white officers are involved and that's that's the crazy part about it but yeah. um you know I, I believe we can be more civilized in the way we go about protesting um wrongdoings by police officers but yeah. you know it's, it's just goes to show you you know um sometimes when things do happen you, you know they're dealt with differently and we're seeing yeah. it in this in this case and i noticed that they have also disbanded the scorpion unit no yes that that, that these guys were part of yes sir Yes, sir. Yeah, back to this thing, though. I mean, I, I still don't understand the, the craziness where people just, you know, you're going into schools or you're going into nightclub and just shooting no people. Good God, man. I mean. Yeah, that, that one is, you know, it's always one. And, and we don't know what sparked these people to do these things sometimes yeah. because sometimes we never get a motive yeah, behind, yeah. behind like, why these mass shootings take Especially when they go kill themselves afterwards, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Beauregard, nice talking to you. You too, sir. Yeah, we've been having this discussion. We're very pleased now to be joined by Professor Anthony Harriet. Now, Professor Harriet is perhaps Jamaica's leading authority on criminology and and related matters. Professor Harriet, welcome to the program. A very good afternoon to you, Prime Minister. Tell me now, uh, protecting human rights and effectively dealing with our high murder rate, uh, is there a conflict between the two? Uh, I, I don't want to be a purist and say, no, there's no conflict. You can protect human rights to the fullest and you can at the same time deal with the criminal gangs out there. Uh, is there some sort of trade-off that has to be made? And Hello? What Hello? should that trade-off be? Hello? You're not hearing me. Mr. Golding. Yes, are I you miss, hearing me? I, I, yeah, I missed a couple of seconds. Yes. There was a break in the transmission. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I was posing to you the question as to whether there is an inevitable, inherent trade-off mm -hmm. between preserving and respecting human rights as are enshrined in our Constitution and effectively dealing with the criminal gangs and our high murder rate. Is there a conflict there and is there a trade-off that has to be made? I would say in our situation there has been a big tension and indeed a conflict between these two things um, that's in the real world um, yes and i think we must we must face it as a fact about the world in which we live is, is there any guidance in terms of how we would face it and how we would okay. how we would balance it all right so we can, one way of dealing with it is to say, one, is it a real trade-off? Which is to say, am I making a trade-off between increased security, improved security, improved order on one hand, and reduce rights and freedoms on the other? Or is it an illusion I am actually in the real world, yielding my rights and my freedoms, but not getting an order and security benefit. That's to me, that, that is one issue. Then there's another way of managing, and second and related issue, if there's a real tension and trade-offs to the means, what are the parameters? So we can say we make trade-offs within the liberal democratic framework, within rule of law. And to go beyond rule of law is to kind of change the, 
the game completely and I don't wish to live outside of rule of law where the word of the policeman is law. I don't want to live under rule of man. I want to live under rule of law. Now, I fear that it has really gone beyond simply saying let us do trade-offs within rule of law. Um, if you look at the survey data, I just want to bring this to your attention and to remind um, listeners. Uh, researchers have been tracking this how people would meet this trade-off in Jamaica at least since 2006. So 2006, there was a survey that put that issue to the public, you know, to a representative sample of the public. What was the response? Uh, Okay, so there is 40-odd percent. I looked at it just before coming on. 43 percent um, said they wanted more order and would be willing to give up rights and freedoms to get more order and more security, right? And 50-odd uh, percent said no, the other way around. Um, they would prefer more rights and freedoms and would have yield a little on the crime and, and insecurity. That was 2006. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to 2016, it has flipped. And you have people now saying they would even go for regime change. A military would support a military coup and a military government that would give them more order on the altar of their freedom and right. That was 2016. But, but tell me, you, I mean, you, you looked at the data. I find that very often the people who are quite willing to say, well, boy, we're prepared to give up some of our rights. They're really talking about giving up other people's rights, not their own. That is so. But, you see, there's more to it than that. It, it, it indicates a level of desperation. Yes. And exaggerated feelings of insecurity that must be addressed. Yes. You know, so there's some validity. We have to read lessons and instructions in the data as well, you know. Is there anything, Tony, that we should pay attention to in the in the El Salvador approach? Uh, put it this way, what, what, what is going on there look like it, it is just crushing human rights into the ground. But, right. but, yes, the, but yes. the principle... The principle of taking out of the communities the what we call the violence producers, a term which the Chief Justice doesn't like. Um, yeah. taking them isolating them from the communities. Uh, mind you, I don't know what Bolivia is going to I don't know what their legal and constitutional position is, so I don't know whether or not they have sixty odd thousand people that they, they have taken up. I mm -hmm. don't know at what point they're gonna to have to let them out again and whether or not they're gonna you, you're gonna be Started the process all over again, but but it is that something that we should be looking at, and is it something that our is this why the states of emergency are seen by the government as the best means of doing it because you can lock up people uh, for extended so why, periods? So why don't we look at it as a within the rule of law trade-off? Yes, and try to discuss it in that way. Yes. Okay. So on the space of it, if you look at the short term results in El Salvador, I'm stressing short term for the moment, you arrest 60,000, which is what we would call net fishing, right? Um, you arrest 60,000. That fact by itself should alert us to the fact that a lot of innocent people may be caught up in that net. Yes. So some collateral damages being done there. Yes. Um, okay. But the result is a dramatic reduction in homicidal violence. Yes. So are, by my rough calculation, they're moving from within our range of 50 odd, 60 incidents per 100,000. And they're now to, they to single digits. Yes. They're now, to, they're now just under 10. All right. So there's a yield. We can't scoff at the yield. Um, so we, we could say, to the extent that the trade-off is being made in El Salvador, it's a real trade-off. 
Is the, it's not is, a, is the it's price not too fraud. high? That, it's not a fraud. Yeah. Okay? And that really is the first hurdle, you know, you know, Mr. Golding, that yeah. people have to get over, right? Um, okay. So you have the 60 term. And they know from the data that they could have expected a result from that because in El Salvador, you have two huge gangs that account for more than 70% of their murder. Tony, Tony, can I ask you to indulge me? Yes. I have Jason McKay holding, and I'd love him to join the discussion because he and I had a discussion some time ago and on this very point. Can I bring him on? And you okay, continue your point? Let's, let's see. Okay, sure. let's see how it goes. Jason, are you there? Hi, how are you doing? I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'm, we're talking with, with, with Professor Anthony Harriet, and he's making some very, very important points in terms of the discussion for today. So let's hear him out. How are you doing, Professor Harriet? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Mr. McKay. Very good afternoon to you. Go, go, go ahead, Tony. You were making the point about the trade off because that, that's a trade off. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah. so what I'm looking to do to do now is to explore the resemblance, the applicability to Jamaica. Yes. Yes. And so I was making a problem, making a comment about the nature of their problem and the extent to which it's similar to ours. Yes. We have some similarities, then we can take the next further step about similarities in response. Right? So, in their case, two huge gangs that account for over 70% of their murders. These are organized crime groupings, not, not gangs as such. Right? Um, and they are engaged in extortion, it's a big source of income, and a source of a lot of the violence and so forth, drug trafficking, you know, the usual kinds of activities. Right? But the point about the two is that this is an advanced process of monopolization of criminal activity. Yes. So the gangs, to, to the extent that they are too huge, a duopoly, they have control over a lot of the violent activities of their members that are under their discipline. Yes. So, so in the lead up to this, you know, a couple of years ago, I can't date it exactly when the government was in peace negotiations with the gang. 2012. All right. There was a time when the gangs shut down the murder rate, you know. Yes. And there was a period of even fewer incidents of violence than what is being experienced now. And they did that as a show of their power. So going into this, El Salvador knew that the, the, the murder is something that you could be turned on and turned off by the gangs, and specifically now, two huge ones. Is, our, is our situation different? Is our situation like that or different? Ah, so I was going to say direct our minds to Jamaica now for similarity. Yes. Right? Do we have that kind of advanced monopoly or duopoly process? We have, if you look locally, Say Spanish Town, St. Catherine. You had a duopoly there up until recently, right? Um, if you look in Kingston, it's not exactly that kind of monopoly process. But our, our, look, our, our gangs, Tony, it seems to me, are much more splintered and much more. Ah, that's my point, but I yeah. was putting a, a, a finer touch yeah. to it. To yeah. say as, you, as you walk across Jamaica, Yes. You are going to see different configurations. When you get into St. James, it's a very far from a monopoly process. Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we have to, it, it seems to me, in our case, uh, between a lot of people. Uh, unless you can pinpoint the specific actors yes. that are committing the homicide the people who are instructing them and the sites of the activities that are generating them, maybe it could be a more spearfishing type of venture. But that, that dissimilarity we would have to take into account where if we are just engaging in a discussion about pure rationality. You want to bring down your murder rate, so let us be indifferent to means 
right? We're looking for efficiency and effectiveness, and yeah. that is what we're studying. We're not studying morality. We're not studying value. Well, let me, morality and values for the moment. Let me put the question to Jason. Jason, can we dare look at the El Salvador model? Or that's something that we shouldn't even... We shouldn't no, even I mean, look at the, it. The, the aspects of the El Salvador situation I like. Um, in which we're saving a lot of lives, and that's really what the focus needs to be on. Yes, it is important that human rights, as particularly as it relates to detention, is, is an observed. Mm. But when they have... The, they, they were actually at 100, 400,000. You know, that is higher than we've ever been. That's our, at our worst, we haven't been at that. So... What they've they've gone from that down to single digit figures very quickly well, because they, of what well, and, I don't, I, and I don't think that that sixty thousand, based on the size of those two gangs, are innocent people. I mean, they, why would they arrest innocent people? You have to feed them after. Yeah, but well, the, well, the report suggests that I'm sure that scrapes up in that sixty one thousand. Must be some people who are innocent. I don't believe of that. Course. And, and, and quite a few people that have not been murdered, that would have been murdered had they not done that scrape up. I like innocent people too. Yeah. It is what they saving lives, and that's far more important. So it's a numbers game? No, it's saving. It's a saving life game. Mm. Tony, is Jason making sense? I mean, what Jason is saying is that, look, it's all well and good. You say, well, in that 61,000, there may be 1,000, there may be 2,000, I don't know innocent persons who get caught. But then, you have more than 2,000 people whose lives have not been snuffed out as a result of that effort. Yeah, um, Jason is more actively involved than I am. I, I, I still have a touch of the ivory tower. Um, so, I, I think, quite frankly, we have to just confront the trade-off aspects of it, which is what you have invited us to confront, Bruce. Yes. And I, I'm kind of sticking with that, right? That, uh, yeah, we, we expect that innocent people are going to be caught up. And then that now opens the, the, the door for an honest discussion about what kind of trade-offs we wish to make. Uh, you can't get to trade-offs if you don't admit that there's a trade-off yeah. issue. How do, we, how, do we get, how do we get the human rights activists? the purest how do we get them to be prepared to budge because one of the things that they will say and I'm sure I'm going to hear it from Horace Levy when I talk to him later on is that if the deer give you an inch you go and take a mile all right so so this is why you have to fix the parameter we can't afford for a rule uh, for an erosion of rule of law and then we if we admit to the I hate the word but let us use it for the moment collateral damage then you need to have things in place to deal with that. When we did, under your, when you were Prime Minister, Mr. Goldie, there was that state of emergency. And the measure that was put in to ensure that the innocent didn't suffer too much was the tribunal, right? People had something that they could go to, right? Now, if you recognize the potential for mistakes and flaws and all of that, then you're going to think through how to put in place measures to minimize. Jason? Yeah, well, I totally agree, Bruce. The, the tribunal is, is, is a must when you have, once you're having this type of detention, they, and they ha there has to be something, some secondary body that gets to review the detention. But it must be viewed for what it really is, and it's a, it's a life-saving mechanism. Well, how do, we, yes. how do we structure the conversation now? Because... I mean, the government is claiming that, look, um, we, we need this continued state of emergency, you know, because that, that is at least enabling us to, to, to keep our feet on the ground and so on. Whenever they try to do that, the opposition says, no, not, not a damn, we're not going along with it. How do we get the conversation going where the human rights advocates, and we could never do without them, but where everybody will at least do what Tony is suggesting, that is, not, let's stop fooling around. There is a conflict, and there is a trade-off that has to be made. So let us acknowledge that, and let us spend the time trying to see if we can define that trade-off. How far are we prepared to go? What we regard it as non-negotiable, don't mess with that. But 
Okay. This is where so, this, this is this is where perhaps we can do a little, a, a, a little you know elasticizing in order to deal with the problem of the fourteen fifteen hundred people that are being murdered every year. Okay, so Mr. Golding, this thing has exercised my mind, you know, considerably. Um, I can be less abstract now, and uh, imagine Tony, how. Tony, Tony, I have to take a break. Let me take a break, and we come right back to you. Uh, welcome back. It's Jamaica Live. We're on Bridge 99. We're talking today about the question of preserving human rights and effectively dealing with the violence and the murders that are taking place. Tony, you were making a point when you took the break. Uh, yes, yeah, so for us to, to collectively think this thing through, there are some hard truths that we have to face, right? And one is that less the routine everyday law enforcement, our serious crime or violent crime problem tends to get out of control. And I would go further as to say to bring it under control and to seriously reduce the problem that we have in any sustained way the crime problem needs a jolt. It needs some kind of extraordinary measure that will achieve some strategic objectives. The first strategic objective in my mind is that you want a shift away from the criminals controlling the crime area in the way that I described earlier with El Salvador. You can turn it on and you have the power to turn it off just like that. You want that power to shift the law enforcement, right? Um, in order to do that, you have to break the power of the criminal organizations in the country. That's a major strategic objective. And that's what, to me, that's one of the objectives of the jolt. The next issue is, how do you manage the jolt? And by managing the jolt, I mean set parameters that are within rule of law, broadly speaking, within the liberal democratic framework. So let's some concrete things about that now. I judge all of the measures in terms of their return. So this is how the trade-off plays itself out concretely. So when there's an issue and I drive and I have to go stay in a long line to go through a roadblock, I had the trade-off. I am making the trade-off, you know. I'm forced to make the trade-off. So I'm going to say, now, what is the yield from this thing? What is the yield from the roadblock that I am going through? And I look at the aggregate yield of that particular measure, and it don't make any sense to me. I don't other objectives, but if you tell me if you're finding guns, if you tell me it's a finding stolen cars, that's a very inefficient way of finding guns and finding stolen cars based on the data that I have seen. I'm getting you know, a terrible but, distortion. Yeah. Is it from your line? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, get, I'm getting it from your end, Mr. Golden. Yeah? What is this from? Well, I don't know. The NGO is looking to see what they can do about it. But, 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 Tony, are you suggesting, therefore, that we're not getting value for the trade-off that we have already made? Because I was going to ask the question, ought, ought, ought we to trade off more? I'm sure that the human rights activists, and I'd love to bring in Horace Levy, the human rights activists, I'm sure, are going to argue, and with, not without justification, that we have already traded off. That is, whenever you have a curfew, you are trading off your, some of your rights. When you have Zoso, you are trading some of your rights. No state of emergency, you're trading even more. And as I said before, uh, uh, Horace, leave me say, look, when I give you an inch, I know you're going to try to take a mile. Horace, am I misrepresenting you? Not with us yet. Right, but did, did, did you understand my, my way of evaluating? Yeah, yeah, no. I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at the tactical level now. Yes. Saying, this tactic is inefficient. This, so this, this, this doesn't make sense. Get rid of this. That one is showing results. Do more of that one. 
Yeah. It's that kind of a test. In other words, it's kind of an empirically minded person, right? And if we're studying effectiveness, then let us put everything to the effectiveness test. And then if it, whatever passes the effectiveness test, we put it to the values test. I'm not doing it the other way around. I'm not putting the values test. You can put the values test up front first if you wish, right? But I'd rather do it the other way around. Tell me, can I ask both of you, both both you, Tony and, and Jason, in your own interaction with the police, do they have in place the kind of analytical tool that says, well, look, this particular strategy we have been trying now for the last six months, let us evaluate it to see what impact it has had, what results it has produced. Uh, or, or, or are they constantly kind of just groping and trying a thing? No, very much, very much so, Bruce. The, the strategies are are analyzed constantly. There's regular meetings regarding them. The task in meetings, analysis is done by the DIU, analysis is done by other areas within the macro section of the force. Um, they, they, there is, it's not just divisional, it's, it's, it's national as well. Uh, it's not done willy-nilly, it's very scientifically applied. Which is why I am less... I'm 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 I I I'm, I'm less in agreement with persons to, who say that it's willy nilly because majority of the persons who are detained are, are in my experience are known offenders. Well, let me bring in I Horace. No, Horace, as, 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 welcome to the program. Are you there, yes, Horace sir? Levy? Yes, 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 please. Yeah, Horace. Uh, uh, the, the, what we've been trying to to sort of drill down on is there an inevitable, intrinsic, inherent um, tension and conflict between preserving human rights as we have enshrined in the Constitution and dealing effectively with the problem of criminal violence that we have? And what Tony Harriet has argued, and I I I'm, I share his view, is that there is an inevitable. Um, tension and conflict that you have to first of all recognize and then determine how do you manage it. Now, some people will argue that perhaps we haven't trained enough. Enough. I suspect that you are going to say, well, in terms of the curfews that we have to live with and the zoos that we have to endure and now the states of emergency, perhaps we have traded off too much. Where do you come down? No, well, I, I. I'm against conceptualizing the whole thing in terms of a trade-off. I mean, it's like uh, it's like uh, trying to trade the economy against the environment. Ridiculous. Uh, we have to take the approach, and I think Tony has set out uh, some point, a point there which I would like to support wholeheartedly, and that is that our situation is quite different from the El Salvadorian one. We we have a multiplicity of groups. Our gangs are not organized in the two big ones. Yeah, locally there might have been two in one or two other places. But overall, our scene is much number one. And point number two is that it's completely false what Chang says. Mr. Goldie, I can't um, follow the conversation. Horace is cracking up. Yes. Right. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Tony. How about this? Is this better? Yes, uh, that sounds a little better. That's what Chang says, that, that they've spent a lot of money, billions, on, on, uh, on social intervention. That's rubbish. He hasn't. His notion of social intervention is completely cockeyed. Completely cockeyed. You know, it's, it's, it's fixing drains and, and roofs and fences. That's not social intervention. It's a small corner piece of it, but it's not the central part of social intervention. Social intervention is, is face-to-face interpersonal relations with, with, with youth, with parents, with children, right? Education, uh, uh, transforming lives, offer them alternatives, helping older people to be- begin to become leaders and so on in the communities. Uh, that's social intervention. They haven't tried that. Uh, and when you compare the little bit of money that PMI spent compared with the billions, tens of billions spent on the security forces to put armored vehicles out there and soldiers and police in numbers, come on. The amount of money PMI has spent is marginal, small, small potatoes. 
So you don't have to spend a huge amount of money to get salt intervention. It can be done in two or three years. You can see the fruits beginning. Uh, I've seen it in PMI personally. I've dealt with it, right? I've seen whole communities free of murder, not just one August town for one year, but others around Spanish town, not a single murder. <coughs> and how precisely by the kind of thing that, 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 that uh, American man there was talking to you at the very beginning of the program, community policing, right? getting in there and lining up the community with you, right? becoming part of it, right? Things that ordinary policing, what, what, what Hardly would call regular policing, not soft, not hard, uh, not, not, not iron-fisted, but, but decent policing. Tony, Tony, where do you factor in the social intervention component? And and is, is it is is it that is it that we must wait until that can be afforded and that can have effect uh, before we can hope to see a reduction in the murder rate? No affording, Bruce. It's not a matter of affording it. It's not that costly. Sorry. Well, I, I don't I, 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 I don't know that it's not that costly because I've never seen anybody cost it out in a way that 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 that, that it doesn't involve a fair amount of resources. And part of the problem, of course, is that when you're doing social programs like these. Uh, you know, it. You spend a dollar here, and a dollar here has ten dollars of effect. You spend that same dollar somewhere else, and you don't get it back. I like cost that's it the major out the PMI. Program. It costed out the PMI thing, a few hundred million, a few hundred, you know, million. Yeah, but look at the scale of uh, that, that compared to what Jamaica would really need. Well, that's the point. It may come up to a billion or two billion, but that doesn't compare with what's been spent already on the police and the soldiers. Tony, let me hear you. Yeah, so number of issues here. Um, different, there are different types of social intervention um, that are appropriate for different settings and will give you different outcomes. Okay. Um, they, they have to be put to the same test as law enforcement. That is the effectiveness and efficiency test. Um, they, are no, they don't come under as much scrutiny for the values test, but I would apply some value tests there too, right? The difficulty we have in Jamaica is that very, very few of these social interventions have been evaluated for design soundness and, and evaluated for effectiveness as outcome, are they achieving their goals? And then you have cost effectiveness. You compare how you spend the taxpayer dollar across social intervention, and social interventions as a whole relative to law enforcement in a particular locale. So the kind of mix that you may wish, me or you may need to get the outcomes in Westmoreland, again, may be different from Spanish Town because of the degree of maturity of the problem in Spanish Town relative to Westmoreland. So when you do the evaluations, you know, they're going to tell stories. They're going to signal to you how to make things better, how to improve what you're doing, right? Quite honestly, I want to see more hard-nosed empirical work in this field. I spent 30 odd years trying to do some of this and um, well Are you can you? Be, no 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 yeah. you can be, I, I don't want to get to, to become too emotional about it. yeah uh, okay I, uh, pre- I, I appreciate just, that yeah let me just just leave it leave it at that, yeah. that if they have to be subjected to the same effectiveness I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that Horace would disagree with that, would you, Horace? What precisely? I'm sorry? <clears throat> I'm not sure what I mean has to disagree precisely with. No, but, but, but Tony was making the point that social intervention measures um, would have to be evaluated, would have to be tested to make sure that they are designed sturdy. Um, and that they're Bruce. cost effective and so on. It's not just a matter of Bruce. funding a program for goodwill. Bruce, Herbert Gale did a study of PMI. A careful, very careful study. Evaluated it and found it extremely effective. Mm-hmm. Right? 
effective for the little money that was being spent on it, right? So it's just not true that there hasn't been an evaluation. Now, it's an evaluation of two areas, one around Spanish Town and one in St. James. I don't Quite think, true. I don't think, no, in fairness to Tony, he was not referring to PMI. I think he was no, making a general he, statement. No, I'm not saying he was, but I'm mm. saying that there has been some evaluation of the kind of social intervention that I was talking about. Mm. Yes, I got emotional. I, 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 I shout and so on. But honestly, you know, the disregard for the facts presented by a Herbert Yale, who is no, no light uh, researcher, right? He's no lightweight, right? Solid, solid stuff, right? For the work of PMI, yes, in small pockets, but, you know, <clears throat> what's wrong with expanding it? The STAR program being proposed by PSOJ attempts, in fact, to incorporate much of the kind of stuff that PMI, the approach that PMI was taking. Gentlemen. And that's what's being suggested. Gentlemen, we, we, we know we are, have delved as deeply as we ought to, but I'm out of time. I want to thank all of you, Professor Anthony Harriet, uh, Dr. Jason McKay, and Mr. Horace Levy, for bringing, in my view, some real, real value to the discussion that we've been having on this topic. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's Jamaica Live, and we're talking today on this issue about trying to see if we can find some harmony, um, some comfort between preserving human rights as we are required to do under our Constitution but at the same time mounting an effective uh, battle against uh, violent crime and, and murder. I'm trying to see if we can find a balance. Um, you know, how, do, how, do we, how do we find a, a position that is uh, compatible for both of those objectives? So we're coming up to the end of the program, but we're going to round off the discussion with Reverend Al Miller, who joins me now. Reverend Al, how are you? I am very well, thank you, my brother. How are you doing? Not bad. How will we come down on this thing? Um, is it that we have to part the human rights for a while until we deal with the old gunman them? Or is there a way that we, we, we can, you know, we can work the two? Well, I think we have to find a way to work the two because you can't destroy the very thing you're trying to build to to obtain to obtain the goal. So there has to be a balance. I'm not going to say... Have we found that easy. balance? I don't know we have found a balance. I don't know if we even fully understand and committed to what it may take in trying to find that. But we, and maybe, and I'm happy for the kind of dialogue that you've been having because it is critical at this stage. But, so, you know, Harris Lee was making the point a while ago, Al. He says we are missing the boat. We believe that t to solve this problem, we must buy more sophisticated gear for the security forces and we must... Um, expand the forces and put more boots on the ground and so on. And so the problem is with the communities and we're not spending the money to try to see if we can wean them little youngsters off the crime and give them a purposeful path to a successful life. You know, again, I, 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 don't, I, don't like to, to, I don't like to deal with extremes no? or the extremities because I, life is never a question of either this or that. Correct. Uh, but part of our problem, and it was there from I was in office, and it is still there, is that if you are to mount a robust social intervention program, we're trying to see if you can make the criminal in the community irrelevant. We're nobody not paying no mind no more. If that is what you are going to do, and you are going to have to do it in sufficient communities to have an impact, you are going to have to do it on such a scale. As Tony Harriet was saying, you have to make sure the program is designed properly. You have to evaluate it and make sure it is having the right impact because you don't want to throw money down down the drain. Yeah. But that money is going to have to come from what you, the money that you're trying to put into the schools and the hospitals. Every, precisely. Everything involves choices. And no? Absolute, absolute, sir. And therefore, that's not, in as much as I understand what Horace would be saying and others, that is important. But that will not necessarily solve the problem and the cost. We can't easily afford the cost. What I believe, since time is an essence for you, is we have to look at ensuring, finding the balance between 
necessary force and justice because you can apply force and maintain justice. What that requires is another word that's not too popular to these days. It's called wisdom and love. If we handle it right, there has to be the balance because if there is not consequences to behavior, but behavior I'll, but will I'll, not change. I'll let, it, let us get it practical on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I am a policeman. I know that is all Miller in this place to fire up the gun because I get information left, right, and center, but I don't have the evidence to put before the court. What I love doing is just lock him, for, lock him away for about six months. Yes. But our constitutional arrangement don't allow you to do that. But you, so you, so you detain him. If you're under a state of emergency, you can hold him for maybe a month. And even then you have to go to tribunal and convince them that you need to hold him. And at the end of the month, him go back out. So all you have done is that you have given him a, a paid one month holiday. Him gone back into the community, gone fire the gun again. Yes. How you cope with that? Now, now what this man is doing in, in El Salvador, and I'm not endorsing it or recommending it, but him lock up some man from March last year, and as far as him concerned, him not to let them go for now. And his murder rate, him had 6,000 odd murders in 2016 or 2015. Last year, his murder dropped to less than 500. Yes. And he, and and, and he, and he enjoys a popularity rating of over 80%. Can you believe that? Yes. But look at what happened to the people and human rights down there. You're right. But you see, as I say, Sergi, wisdom has to find, be found in it and a balance. Yes. And hence I feel we need to sit together because I believe the majority of citizens in this country would appreciate that. But the fearful side where you have to respect the human rights is in a just way. Well, and what will it make? What would we have to do to find that balance? I believe it, it, it's there. We can do it. There is a way to well, do the man, it. The man, from El, the, the, man, the man from El Salvador will tell us that him, them find the balance down there, but we are ramp. <laughs> and in, that's why I said we have to look, we have to decide, Mr. Golden, where do we want our country to go? What is it going to take to put, get us there? What is hindering us from getting there? And, after, and make some tough decisions, even for a season. And after I, the problem is to look at it and say, look, Give everybody understanding and the vision. For yes. a season, you have to sometimes, when the pendulum has swung far in one direction, when you let it go, it is going to swing a little to the other side to find I'll, balance. And I'll, that's necessary sometimes. Yeah, and my pendulum swing in the opposite direction now because I'm out of time and I forgot to thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Let's continue to talk. Me. Yeah, man, we're going to get back to it. All well, right. First, thank, thank you very much, Reverend Al Miller. I want to thank all my guests today. Uh, former Commissioner Hardy Lowen, former SSP Renito Adam, Professor Anthony Harriet, Dr. Jason McKay, Horace Levy, Reverend Al Miller. Had a spirited discussion today. Thank my producer, thank my engineer. All things being equal and God's willing, we'll be back next week Monday to do it all over again. Have a good week. <laughs>